Hello and welcome to Perspectives, the APT's podcast which explores contemporary issues related to torture prevention and dignity in detention. I'm Almodena Garcia, APT's Digital Communication Advisor, and we are delighted to share with you the first of two episodes exploring the psychology of police interviewing. Associate Professor Dr. Kai Lee Chung is Head of Psychology at the University of Reading, Malaysia. A leading researcher in forensic psychology, her research explores how psychology can be applied to improve criminal justice systems with a focus on investigative interviewing practices. This series was recorded at a seminar in Kuala Lumpur on the Mendes Principles on Effective Interviewing where Dr. Kai Lee shared her research and insights with representatives from civil society organizations and national human rights institutions from Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. My area is, um, I, I was trained as a, as a psychologist in the sense that I, I did my PhD in forensic psychology. And what forensic psychology really actually means is that um, psychology that is applicable in, in law. So um, I have a special interest in forensic psychology I'm interested in understanding how the knowledge um, in psychology can be used to improve criminal justice system. Okay, so that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. So what I'm going to talk about today, just to caveat a little bit, is going to be based on psychological research, some theories, some data. And, and what I would like to do first is to sort of talk about the psychology behind um, investigative interviewing. Because I think that's very, very important to understand what was the practice before, why is it problematic, and how we can move forward. Okay, so I'm very lecturer style. <laughs> I want to do a bit of a sort of an understanding of a, uh, you know, what, what do people think. And this is usually what I get. Every time when we ask about, would you ever confess to a crime that you did not commit? My psychology students will say, absolutely no way I will do it. And every time I will re-ask this question at the end of my lecture, um, and then the percentage sort of moves in a little bit. Um, and, and the reason why I want to do this poll is because I am going to talking a little bit about false confessions, which is the very thing that we are trying to uh, prevent um, in the criminal justice system. So although I research in forensic psychology, I have a very, very special interest in the way in which police conduct interviews. Um, and that's why the work that I have is really to understand why do they conduct interviews the way they do? And is there any room for improvement? And if so, what are the, the, the challenges that prevent them from improving their, their practice? And to bear in mind that this is work that has been done very much largely um, in, in Western European countries. We actually know very little about the work within our region. Um, and I think, I think that is perhaps one of the things that we can we can try and improve in the, in the next few years. And then finally, um, I'll touch a little bit upon the work that has been based on more peaceful methods of interviewing and why do we endorse the Mendes principles. Okay, I know that this case comes up very often in a lot of um, police interviewing uh, training manuals and stuff like that. This is very, very famous Central Park jogger case. So there was a female jogger who was running in Central Park she subsequently got beaten, raped, sodomized, and left for dead um, just in, in Central Park. She did not die, but she, she, she couldn't remember a single thing that happened during that attack, you know, because they, they really beaten her really badly um, at the brain, so she temporarily she forgotten the incident. Immediately, during the initial police investigation, it was focused upon a group of African-American as well as Latino youth, you know, and they were, they, they, they started uh, being interrogated. And this was afterwards, they found out that after very, very aggressive interrogations, all the boys confessed, and four of them confessed of, um, on, on videotape. They went to trial, they were convicted, and they were sentenced to prison. And they were known as the Central Park Five back then, and now I think they're known as the Exonerated Five. Because what happened after that, was um, they, were, they were exonerated because of DNA evidence that found out that somebody actually already serving time in prison, they, they confessed to this crime 
and they managed to match the DNA evidence that it really is this person called Matthias um, Rice who committed the crime. So it makes us question, why? Why was the confession so convincing? Why were they convicted because of the, conf the, the confession that's, that was being videotaped? And, and why, even with sometimes with DNA evidence, the confession evidence is actually stronger that if you were a judge, if you were a juror, you believe more the confession evidence because, back to the poll we did just now, if I were to ask you, would you ever confess to a crime that you did not commit? It's usually a resounding no. So if you confess, you must have done it. Am I right? Yeah? And what's really interesting when you look at the testimony and the, the, the confession, you know, they signed it, that means that you agree that this is what has happened. And it's usually very, very detailed. They talk about the sights, the colours, what they did, the smell. It's very, very detailed and, and vivid. And that is why the average person find it very, very difficult to understand why people would confess to something that they did not do. What are the percentage of false confessions that occur in the criminal justice system, you think? Just a wild guess. It's about 16 to 27% in the United States, according to um, some estimates, very, very rough estimates, because it's very, very difficult to get data like that. And that's the thing in, in forensic psychology research. We cannot really know the ground truth um, in, a lot of, in, in a lot of reality, you know. Somebody, somebody who confesses, you cannot really assume that they are making a false confession or a true confession. And you may argue that, well, not, not like, let's say 50%, but 27%, mm, he's all right, you know. Um, but there's always a saying in the criminal justice system where it is much more damaging to send somebody innocent to prison than to let some a perpetrator go. And, and you know, again, it, it depends on how, to, to what extent the innocence uh, uh, that people falsely confess because that is tied into practice, interviewing practice. So if you did interview practices well, again, we cannot do it perfectly because we're all humans. Um, if you did it well, the chances of this can be reduced significantly. And that's, that's the kind of aim we're trying to get at. But common things, eyewitness identification. And if you went through a lecture with me, I'll talk you, to you about how the human memory is really flawed. Um, so eyewitness identification, just because you point to the person and say, I know it was you done it, you could be wrong. Because if crime usually happens under distress, it happens really fast. You know, that's, that's the thing. Our memory is really flawed. Our face recognition skills are also pretty bad um, if you look at uh, the research. But eyewitness identification in error can happen. Junk forensic science, you know, so back in the day when technology was not very uh, advanced. And if you see some of the, the Innocence Project cases, they will say, oh, they saw a bite mark yeah. and they say the bite mark is mine. And that's it. And that was what I was uh, convicted based upon. So junk forensic science, um, this is an interesting one. Legal misconduct is when there is um, some purposeful misconduct among the authorities, but sometimes there's also legal inaptitude, which is something that we can, we can change. So it means that they are not very skilled. Authorities are not very skilled at what they're doing, which can be improved with education and training. And finally, of course, I, I talked a little bit about false confessions. So when a confession comes about, that's usually uh, the reason why uh, uh, no cases are being convicted. So these are some of the risk factors. Risk factors means that under what circumstances will somebody be more likely to falsely confess? It doesn't mean that, you know, there's a type of person that will definitely falsely confess, but these are risk factors. It could be that, you know, especially young children and adolescents um, are, are, are the greatest risk. And that's why we've got safeguards for vulnerable populations. Yeah. And then you've got cognitive and intellectual disabilities. Yeah. Personality and psychopathology, mental illnesses, disabilities can also cause a person to be more likely to confess. But what I'm really interested in is actually the circumstances in interrogation, like I mentioned. These are what we call system variables. So these are things within the criminal justice system that we can manipulate, change, amend in order to improve the outcomes of um, a legal investigation.
Okay, so we've talked about police interviewing. We've talked a bit, uh, but we've not actually talked, touch upon the word interrogation that much. What do you think there's a difference between police interviewing and interrogation? Just, just humor me, the Malaysians. What's the what's the word for interrogation in Malay? So I'll guess that. Is that a very neutral word? It means question, investigate, right? Is that a neutral word? You think it's not like it doesn't sound super coercive, isn't it? It just means that I'm interested in finding out. But if you notice the new principles, they've actually changed it to penumbuh bual penyasatan. So penumbuh bual implies interviewing, which is in a way more pleasant. It's just like like a job interview that you go to. Uh, but in general, I think I think that the point is interrogation. Even the English word is always implies torture. It implies that I'm trying to get a confession. The aim of an interrogation is to get a confession, because again. If somebody were to be um, taken into custody or somebody who would be arrested, you must have some strong reasons to believe that that person is involved in a crime, isn't it? Why would you think otherwise? Yeah, right place at the right time, um, or you know, the person who falsely confessed will say you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong circumstances. Um, and and interrogation implies that uh, it's it's often to to gain some form of confession and some. Some coercive methods are being used. Okay, even though actually, if you look at the definition, it's very neutral. Questioning a person who is suspected of crime and who is in custody. Um, and sometimes this, um, from a sort of academic perspective, we always say it's usually initiated when there's weak evidence. Because if you had DNA, if you had uh, a CCTV, you've got you've got the person right. But it's usually because there's no evidence. Then the confession becomes heavily weighted, because again, going back to the idea, if you didn't do it, you won't confess. But if you confess, you must have done it. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to to briefly mention that if you look at data all over the world, there are generally two methods. Generally speaking, very very broad sense, there is the accusatorial, where it is confession driven, and I'll talk a little, little bit about the read technique. The reason is because there's actually a manual. That teaches investigators how to get a confession from suspects.、Um, it's really controversial, and they, they've they've evolved the manual throughout the years. But then there are some psychologically manipulated techniques that are still very very much the core of the the techniques, which we'll talk about. And there's information gathering process, which is what the principles of、um, the Mendes principles is based upon. What is the difference between these two techniques? Do they equally、um, are able to Not only obtain confession, but we're talking about reliable confession, but at the same time reduce、uh, the chances of false confessions. So this is、um, the read technique,、um, and it's extensively used in, in in the United States of America, and it usually goes through a two phase approach. And they claim or they argue that the first phase is very much information gathering. They don't presume guilt,、um, and we'll look at what what the claims are and how. How、uh, psychological research、um, has has either supported or or disputed the the findings、um, and interrogation. So they start off with having a behavioral analysis interview, and this is in the in the in the manual where they claim that it's a neutral information information gathering interview, and its its aim is to determine whether or not a person is guilty or self or innocent. So they say that if the person is guilty, we'll continue on with the interrogation. If the person is not guilty, that means that that's that's fine, you know. Then they will move on.、Um, but the issues that psychologists usually have is how do they determine whether or not a person is guilty or innocent? And it's very much based on whether or not they think the person is telling a lie. And they claim that trained investigators, if they're trained in 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 the read technique, they have up to eighty five percent of accuracy level. Through psychological research, what do you think? What is the percentage of accuracy when it comes to judging truth and deception? Forty, somebody said. Thirty, twenty. What is our ability of detecting lies and deception? Zero. <laughs> Zero.、Um, the actual result is usually about fifty percent. You and I have only about chance level of determining whether or not a person is telling truth or telling lies. Do you think police investigators are better? Do you think people can be trained to be better at detecting lies? 
I can give a whole lecture about that. But there are some evidence that police officers can be trained to, or not, but generally speaking, people can be trained to be better lie detectors, but only if you are looking at verbal cues, asking your suspects to speak. So what does the, the Mendes principle advocate is that you want to get more information. If you are going to be coercive, they are going to shut up. No information, no way of telling whether or not they're telling a truth or lie. Yeah. So the cognitive interview that comes behind all this interviewing is really to get as much, get them talking, but giving you reliable information. And when you want to identify whether or not they're telling the truth or lies, you can then use specific strategies through the verbal cues. In general, behavioral uh, symptoms, like whether or not they have eye contact, whether or not they fidget, whether or not they sweat, all of these are unreliable cues of um, lie detection. That means if you rely on their body language, almost certainly you will not be very, very accurate at detecting lies. But anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the read technique claims that if you're trained, you get 85% accuracy, and this is not very fun. And that's the trouble. If investigators believe in this, they would just endorse this technique, isn't it? So again, the idea is that we should be basing a lot of our practice on evidence-based research, not on claims made by um, people in general. So don't trust everything I say. Verify the information that I'm telling you. Yeah? Okay. So... Once they identify that this person is telling a lie, they go through this official interrogation method. And the problem with the read technique is because it presumes guilt. What this means is that they're going there to, to gain a confession because you assume this person is guilty. Yeah? And it's psychological oriented, um, and you may not necessarily have to use any form of physical torture, but it's highly confrontational and highly accusatory. And the aim is to get an outcome. Uh, confession. And it's very systematic because they tell you there are nine steps to do it. First of all, you have a direct positive confrontation where you tell the suspect that there's evidence to show that they are guilty. And this can be true or a lie. So in certain jurisdictions, correct me if my wife, we've got representative from the Bar Association, but certain jurisdictions do not allow lying to the, to the suspect. You cannot say that you've got evidence against them if you do not have. But under the read technique, um, in the past at least, it was allowed. You can tell them that there's evidence against you, and this is an opportunity, you know, they phrase it in a very nice way, for you to tell the truth. And then they go on with doing some theme development. Theme development means you go, with, you go along with the story, and usually people always have a backstory. You know, they tell you they didn't do it, um, and then you try and, and, and go through a, a theme development where um, you, you present a moral justification. So you say, well, you didn't do it because you are a mean person. You did it because they made you do it. It was because, you know, you really needed money and therefore you, you broke into the house. Um, and and they, they tried to do some form of moral justification. And then they would present it in a very sympathetic manner. But this sympathetic manner, I'm sure some of you have done the e-learning, it's not genuine. It is a technique to get people to speak. Um, and this is something that, that is, is considered not ethical, as we know from the Mendes principle. Almost certainly, they would deny if they were not, whether or not you've, you've done it, if you're arrested, you would deny that your, your involvement. Um, but the investigators are asked to discourage them, shouldn't allow them to deny it. And then they would then try and say that, you know, you would say, oh, but we saw your handprints there. And then the person will try and say, well, you know, it, it couldn't have been because I wasn't there or anything. So they would try and overcome any form of objections, continuing with this sort of, you know, as you heard before, the good cop, bad cop, you know, trying to be very sympathetic, but at the same time, um, telling them that, you know, it, it must have been you. What do you think globally is the average interrogation time? data suggests that for those people who falsely confess, the average interrogation time is about six hours. Very obviously, from a psychological perspective, you would try, your attention goes away because you're tired, you know, you're hungry, um, and, and, and therefore you would, your, your attention goes off. But the, the idea, recommendation to police officers is that you go closer to them to invade their space. 
like I said, they're tired and the investigator is asked to continue to display a very sympathetic demeanor in order to urge them to, to tell the, the, the truth, which is essentially to confess. Now, I'll talk a little bit about um, presenting an alternative questions, but basically they, they give them two questions and they want them to, to pick one answer. I'll talk a little bit about what that means later on. And then the next step, of course, is to get them to orally relate to the details of, of the offense. And that's when you get very, very detailed uh, details about the, the supposed offense. And in the end, you ensure that they convert this into a written form and you ask them to sign it. So this is according to the manual. It has an interrogation room recommended layout. This is generally what they recommend that is, you know, you get a very small, smallish room, soundproof, bare, lighting should be minimum so that it, you know you can invade the space whenever possible. Um, the room should be fitted with a one-way mirror to give them a sense of that they are being watched, but they don't know what's who's watching them. And also there's practical reasons, you know, sometimes they, they say that a, a mirror for observation is useful because you can then, if somebody's telling a lie, you know, you're asking them to change their method of interviewing, you can, you can do that. But the idea again is to create a, a physical environment that is supposed to promote the sense of isolation and they, they feel very, very helpless, which can increase their chance of confessing. So, so this is back in 1990s, it's all old experiment, but it gives them a, a very good um, sort of pre-evaluation of whether or not this technique is actually useful. So this is an experiment done by uh, Saul Kassin, which is a, is a very uh, famous uh, psychologist um, who has done research in this area. They wanted to know whether or not this lie detection that we're talking about. Remember, they've got this behavioral analysis interview where they say that, you know, you can detect lies to up to 85% accuracy. So they wanted to evaluate whether or not this is true. So they wanted to ask whether people in general can differentiate when somebody is giving a true denial or a false denial. Um, and they wanted to know whether if you train people in using cues um, to lie, you know, to say if you identify this person uh, who's avoiding eye contact, they, are, they must be telling you lies. Whether or not training people can improve their accuracy. In psychology, we have this, what we call a mock crime paradigm, where you would create a fake crime situation you ask them to be part of that crime situation and then you will do some manipulation and they will find out the results. So what they did here is that they had university students, half of them, they asked them to commit a crime. So they say, go and vandalize this wall, write something obscene. And half of them were asked to just go and watch, look at this, this wall that has some obscene messages on it. So you have one group that has done the vandalism who is guilty and then one group which is innocent because they were just there to view the wall. And what they were told is that, you know, once you've done this, you'll be asked, you'll be interrogated. And your aim is to convince them that you are innocent, right? So they were stopped by a security guard and then they were taken for interrogation. Um, and they will say that, you know, if you're caught, make sure that you just do not sign the confession. Make sure that you say that you are innocent. And what was interesting is that these interrogations were recorded. Okay, so the interrogation process was recorded. And they had another group of people to watch this interroga interrogation through the videotapes. These observers, 40 of them, half of them were trained in the read technique and half of them were just naive people, you know, they, they don't know any better about the read technique. They watched this interrogation and they said, okay, this, in this videotape, some people are lying. Can you tell me who is the truth teller and who is the liar? And these are the findings. You've got trained people who has about 45% accuracy so even below chance, look at the naive ones. In fact, they were better. If you were not trained, you were better at telling whether or not a person is a truth teller or a lie teller. But look at the confidence. They also asked them, how confident are you that you are accurate? Trained people were more confident. And there's a thing, you know, in, in our research that look at confidence as well as accuracy. Confidence does not always relate to accuracy. Just because you're very sure about the accuracy of it doesn't mean that you are correct. They did it back in, in 2002 again. And then what do, you, what do you notice here? They were not any better at identifying truth teller and, and, and lie, uh, lie tellers, but they were significantly more confident about their ability to do so. So there's a danger here that experience and qualification indicates accuracy. 
Yeah, it's just just something to 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 bear in mind. Okay, so I want to move a little bit about um this idea of why do people wave their this is I think in the US they call it Miranda rights. I think in Malaysia we call it right to silence. So you know this is something that you know about. You know you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you. Um, you have the right to an attorney. Um, and 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 so we want them to retain these rights, right? Because it's important as a safeguard. But what they found out was interestingly, why a lot of people actually waive this right in the sense that the moment they are being questioned, they speak, even though they know very well they shouldn't speak until they have a lawyer. So why do people speak even though they have the right to remain silent? So this is what this research was interested in finding out. Again, a very typical mock crime paradigm um, where somebody did something guilty and somebody was innocent. Um, and they were asked to, uh, they were asked to not waive their Miranda rights. They also, these experimenters also manipulated the way in which they were being interviewed. So, in one condition, they asked them to 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 read the Miranda rights in a very very neutral, um, neutral manner, where they said that um, you just read the Miranda rights verbatim, and then there is a sympathetic condition where they asked the experimenter to. You know, tell the participants just relax. This is just a formality. You know, um, you know, I, you, I think that you are guilty, but, but, but uh, let's let's go through the interview to see whether or not you really are. And then there's another condition where they're really, really hostile, where they would say, "I'm sick of this of happening." You know, I know you did it. Just don't waste my time and let's get through with it. Just confess. Okay. So there's three different types of way in which they were being read their Miranda rights. The detective who interviewed these people. Did not know which group was innocent or which group was guilty, so that's that's an important thing, you know, to be blind about who is guilty so that you cannot be biased. But the detective or the interviewer was asked to give the form to the participants and ask them to either choose that they are willing to make a statement or not willing to make a statement. So whether or not they will sign off their Miranda rights. So this is the percentage of participants who agreed to waive their rights. The innocent people were more likely to waive their rights to silence. The innocent people are more likely to start talking even though they shouldn't. Why is that the case? So we talk about the naive faith of the power of innocence will set them free. And if you remember the interview this just now when I showed, it says that I thought the police were there to protect me. If I was innocent, surely they would protect me and not 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 let me go to jail. So there's a lot of these ideas of how innocence will set them free, and this idea that we call it a belief in a just world. In psychology, we have this concept where you believe that bad people will get the bad, you know, the bad things will happen to them. The good people will have good things happen to them, and it shouldn't be the other way around. But in reality, that's that's not necessarily the case. So this, in this naive idea that you believe that there's a just world, um, sometimes can cause them to waive their innocence right. Our systems are supposed to be transparent, but they're often not. But again, the general public think that this is the criminal justice system. I'm supposed to be protected. So if I didn't do anything wrong, nothing bad should really happen to me. This is an, an, an illusion that they believe in. So what this tells us is that a lot of these warnings that we have, we routinely tell people, is actually not very sufficient to protect the people who need it the most. And there's a lot of work that looked into the sort of legal. Legal saying that we tell people, and a person with an average intelligence may not necessarily understand the legal terms that we use, and this is very interesting because um, if you if you were to be read your legal rights, you must understand those legal rights first. If you don't understand, how are you supposed to make a decision based on something that you don't understand? Yeah. So I think that's something for us to reflect upon when we use. You know, as academics or as lawyers or as I mean, we use our very high tech the words, the very you know our our jargons and law. The average population may not necessarily understand that. Associate Professor Dr. Kai Lee Chung is head of psychology at the University of Reading, Malaysia. The second episode of this two-part series is also available. You can also download the transcripts. Thanks for listening to Perspectives, and we look forward to your company next time.